you've got your Bibles tonight, I think where we're eventually going to wind up is Proverbs 22. So uh, you can you can open your Bible there. It might be a few minutes before we get there. Oh, I don't know. I think it was last November. So it was about a year ago. Um, I got asked to do a um, a family seminar, if you want to call it that, uh, a family meeting in um, Prince Albert at Prince Albert Baptist Church there in Saskatchewan. And a number of years before that, we had done something similar to that in Houston. <laughs> Um, in right after I resigned my church and there was a few month interval and uh, we were, we were just sort of hovering at another church. I say all that because, um, in the months that followed that a number of people in our midst, several, it's come up several times. People said, pastor, would you do something like that here? And so I, I want to do that, but I'm going to, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to make it super lengthy. Um, you know, we'll take a few Wednesday nights and just cover some things. And really what I want to do is, um, I just want to be a blessing. I, I realize even from the outset, um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to say, it, it's going to, um, especially initially, a lot of it will seem like it's really aimed at parents with very young children, but you have to remember a couple things. Um, we got a lot of single people in here, and they are going to be parents should the Lord tarry. Um, and they need to hear some of these things. And I really want to keep it really basic. And uh, what I'm hoping is you'll just some just a few key things will really stick. Um, and those of you that you know your kids are older, you know we'll probably cross a few bridges uh, along that line. Uh, some of you that your kids are long grown, um, you know, uh, maybe the Lord will give you something that you can use to help some of the younger parents. Um, and, and at the very least, you can pray that God will um, really help some people as we go over this in the next few weeks. Um, you know, I want to say right at the start, I do not pretend to have all the answers, you know, um, but I want to share some things that we have seen and learned. And I want to say this. This is one of those subjects that almost nobody touches. I mean, you'll get the odd comment now and again in a message. But um, um, but over and over and over again, you know, we've seen, you know, we've been at various churches and we see families and we see them struggle. Um, and we see them struggle with their kids. We see horrendous things going on with their children. And, and the problem is they're not bad people, but they're clueless. And their pastor never says a word. You know, he preaches the gospel and he preaches doctrinal truth. But he doesn't hit on stuff that's real specific to raising children and, you know, and, and you know, teenagers and marriages and all that stuff. Uh, very, almost very seldom. I don't know how many times I've heard the comment. Somebody will say, Nobody ever talks about this, but the Bible has a lot to say about it. Um, I got a few introductory comments, so it's probably going to be a little jumpy for a minute here. I want to say this thing of your family is life or death. Society is against you. The devil is against you. And Satan is determined to destroy you and yours. You know, we mentioned this Sunday night. People's situations are very complex. And I am not suggesting that every situation has a real 
easy, quick fix. You know, you know, buy my book, five steps to a better home, you know, and, and some of that stuff can be helpful. But, you know, uh, there there's no one, two, three, poof, and it's fixed. It just doesn't work like that. But all that said, often the solution is much simpler than than the devil would let on. You know, Paul said, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, I'm I'm probably going to make the odd statement. I, I can't qualify every statement that I make. So if I say something and you have a question, you are more than welcome to ask. You know, don't don't feel like I'm not going to feel threatened. I'm not going to be upset. You know, please feel free to ask questions. If you have come from an abusive background. If you have come from an abusive background, you will view some of what I say from your dark glasses. And if you're not careful, you'll throw out the baby with the bathwater. Abuse is very real, but the, the word abuse really gets overused. And if you have soaked in secular psychology, you're going to have a hard time with some things that I say. Let God be true. You know, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Some people will say, you know, I'm going to say this or that or the other. And somebody will say, oh, I tried that and it didn't work. To which we reply. There is no problem with God or with his method. The problem always lies somewhere else. Another thing, too, you know, we are not forecasting. You know, uh, in other words, I, I'm not saying that if you, you know, if you do everything just perfectly. And by the way, none of us do everything perfectly. But even if you do really well at all this, we're not saying that Johnny will never go astray. We are not saying that. Remember, the prodigal son had the best of fathers. In the story of the prodigal son, the father, the picture is God is the father. And there were two sons raised in the same house. One went astray and one did not. But one day the prodigal did come to himself and he knew where to come and he knew how to get right. So we are, we are not, you know, some people, I've heard guys preach on this stuff and they'll say, no, oh, bless God, you know, if you do this, you know, they're, they're, they just will, you know, they'll never turn out wrong. And it's like, oh boy, you just painted a bullseye on yourself when you say that. There is some key things, you know, there's the mechanics, there's the work involved. Um, and some of these thoughts are going to overlap. You know, you're going to hear me repeat some things, which actually is a good thing because that's one of the keys to learning is repetition. Um, but there is the mechanics. You must do them. You say, well, I'll just, I'll just bring Johnny to church and just pray for him. Well, I, I'm glad you're going to do that. But if you don't do your part, it, it's not going to turn out well. There is the mechanics. And it is work. Um, if you anything worth doing is, you know, is worth doing right. And if it's worth doing right, it's a lot of work. It's just everything good takes work. And, and that's really where a lot of parents drop the ball. Is because they're they're good workers in some areas. There's some guys, man, they're they're just they're never late for work and they're there 60 hours a week. And and you know, um, mama does her thing and and she really, you know, she works at certain, but you know what they don't work at? Their kids. And then when they hear what God wants them to do, it's really a great bother to them. 
because they already feel like they're stretched to the max. And they feel like, oh, so now you want me to do all this too? It's like, number one, I'm not asking you to do anything. This is about you and the Lord. Maybe it would be wise. You know, half our problem sometimes is the way we handle what we call priorities. And I think sometimes our priorities are horribly messed up. And we put things first that ought to be way down the list. And we put things way down the list that ought to be way up top. And of course, there is the element of seeking God. Hudson Taylor said long ago, he said, you can work without praying. It is a bad plan, but it can be done. You know, you can do all the right procedure stuff. You can say, well, I, I took him to church and I put him in Christian school and I and I made him memorize a thousand verses and I, you know, and I, I beat their hiney till it glowed in the dark and I and I, I did all that stuff and they still went crazy. I got a question. Did you spend any time wrestling with God behind closed doors? Or was that just one more thing you didn't want to invest any time in? You see, accept the Lord, build the house. They labor in vain. They labor in vain that build it. So the moral of the story is, do all you can do. The old saying goes, you work like everything depends on you. And then you pray like everything depends on God. Um, this whole thing, um, we uh, it, it is intended to be a, a spiritual work. Uh, this thing of your family, whether it's your marriage or your little kids or your teenage kids or whatever, it is intended to be a spiritual work. Some of the things that we're going to talk about even tonight, they can be done from a purely practical and earthly standpoint. Um, you know, we're going to talk about this. So here's the key word for tonight. We're going to talk more about it next week. We're not going to be lengthy tonight. Um, but there is a key word for tonight. The guys always ask me, Pastor, what's the title? And half the time, I don't even know. I look at them and I say, I don't know, you guys. What do you think we should call it? But tonight, it's really simple. Tonight, the key word is training. If you can get a hold of that, that will save you hundreds of hours of misery and stress and frustration and embarrassment. Training. It can be done from a purely practical and earthly aim, as with the military. The military is not concerned about creating spiritual giants. In fact, that's not even a thought. But they have learned the value of training. And their training is intense. It is nonstop. It is rigorous, um, and it's just from a purely practical standpoint. They know what training produces. Oh, dear Father. The children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. They understand. You pour on the training, and you'll get the results you're looking for. They understand that. They have no doubt about how the training is going to turn out because they're going to make it happen. And their success rate is 100%. There's the odd deserter that disappears, but their success rate is almost 100%. You give them 12 weeks with a rotten teenager who doesn't know how to make his bed and can't get up in the morning, and 12 weeks later, he walks out of there, and he's walking tall, and his head's up, and he's in shape, and he wakes up at 5 in the morning without an alarm clock. It only took 12 weeks. You know, uh, Pastor, I don't think I can handle all the work. You're dreaming. If you poured your heart and soul into it, even from a practical standpoint. Now, I realize I'm we're talking about, you know, you start, you start here when they're little guys, okay? That's what we're talking about. When the tree's this tall, it's a lot harder to bend it. 
And I, I, I know when they enlist in the military, they've enlisted voluntarily and nobody can, nobody can charge them with child abuse. But they're taking 18, 19, 20, 22, 24-year-olds, and 12 weeks later, this is not an exaggeration. They are transformed. 12 weeks of training is all it took. You undervalue training. And lost parents of years ago did it. Now, they were rough around the edges, perhaps, but they recognized the benefit. You you go back, you go back to my dad's generation. You go back to when I was growing up. Um, they re I'm thankful I wasn't born in the year 2000. Because I'd probably be, I, you know, I, hang on to your seat. This is not, I'd, I'd probably be a drug addict. You say, why do you say that, Pastor? Because I was born in 1963. It's way back there. They actually had wheels back then. <laughs> I was born in 1963. By the time 1969, oh, by the time uh, I was born in 19, by the time 1969 rolled around, I was in school. They had already diagnosed me as being hyperactive. And that was in the early days. Now it's ADHD and PHP3 and 4TFQ. And now they got they got a title for everything. But but they didn't call it ADHD. They just called it hyperactive. You know what they did? They put me on medication. And um, I don't know what my dad was thinking. My dad was probably thinking, maybe, you know, maybe my dad was thinking I needed it. But my dad was no dummy. And um, I had a reaction to the medication. Thank God. I, I've seen some kids on that medication. I remember a little girl we used that were dear friends of ours. And when she was on Redland, she was a zombie. Now, maybe they're not all like that. Okay. But I had a reaction to the medication. So dad took matters in his own hands. And he cured me. Rapidly. It was miraculous. Shock treatments. I'll have to tell you about those later. <laughs> you know what? Those parents of that generation, they recognized the benefit of training. And they had the personal self-discipline to do it. I mean, they just figured either the kid's going to be miserable or I'm going to be miserable. And they took a vote and they decided the kid was going to be miserable. <laughs> And they had the self-discipline. They were just, they were just not going to put up with that nonsense. Boy, what a strange age we live in. And that generation had no fear of legal complications. I mean, if you were misbehaving in the store and your mom took a swat at you, the, the person in the buggy next to you, if if your mom hadn't swatted you, they would have swatted you. <laughs> They had no fear of legal complications. You see, there was a day not that long ago when society operated on law and order and strict enforcement. You know what that is? That's a carryover from Christian roots in our society. The Old Testament was all about law and order and strict enforcement. And it produced a pretty good society. Wasn't perfect. No son of Adam will be perfect. But it was pretty good for a bunch of lost people. One of the key words is training. Many are not training, and yet they are. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no rigid training going on. There's no practice sessions at home. There's no, okay, Johnny, let's try this again. All right, Johnny, let's try this again. All right, Johnny, let's try this again. All right, Johnny, let's try this again. There's none of that going on, but there is some stuff that's regularly being repeated. You know, Johnny pushes mommy to the end of her sanity, and she's about to lose it. Mommy wasn't feeling good anyway because she didn't sleep last night. So, so Johnny is asking for this, and mommy says, no, Johnny. And, and Johnny asks again, no, Johnny. Yeah. No, Johnny. And then, oh, and 
and and and and and and, and right, right about that point, Johnny's got to back off. See, and Johnny knows. See, mommy's training him. She's training him that she'll put up with unbelievable stuff until she's just about ready to be hospitalized from insanity and high blood pressure. And you're training that kid. Oh yeah, Mama Mia, you're training them. I watch kids in here. I know there's no training going on in some quarters or very little, and yet there's much training going on. You say, what do you mean? Kids are doing laps in here. And I look at them and say, stop running. And they look at me and they don't stop running. We were trained not only to obey our parents, but any adult that told us anything, barring something immoral. And um, it was a fearful thing when an adult stepped in. You know, adults were nice and kind. And, and, and you know, right away, see, you, you got to watch because your, your mind is going to play the other end. Your mind is going to go, well, you know, well, what about somebody abusing their authority? Can you, can you just stop that for a minute and stop listening to the devil? And just tell him to go away and listen to what's being said. When an adult looked at us and said, don't run. We didn't even think of challenging that. And then when they said, and this would happen. Oh, I'll never forget. I was in public school. And one day the principal, I was in the principal's office for a very insignificant matter by today's standards. And the principal looked at the teacher who sent me to the office and said, uh, should we call his parents? I broke down sobbing. I said, oh, don't call my dad. Don't call my dad. Don't call my dad. Because I knew what was going to happen if they called my dad. You know what? Dad wasn't going to be mad at them. Dad was going to give me another one of them shock treatments. <laughs> I didn't even think about doing drugs. I didn't even think about it. I was worried about throwing too many spit wads. I was worried about getting caught with an overloaded water pistol. <laughs> See, we did deep, dark things back then. <laughs> See, we were trained and certain fears were instilled. Happy. Oh, you better throw your psychology book in your toilet. Happy is the man that feareth always. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Why does the, what's that got to do with delivering somebody from hell? Oh, see, they learn that they, the person in authority carries not the sword in vain. And that judgment falls. And when they hear about a God in heaven who in judgment awaiting for every sinner, that child, that young person says, I believe this and I will receive this. Why? Because certain fears have already been in place. One of the key words is training. I want to I want to tell you this tonight. The little children, the little children, they will respond to training. You say, oh, you don't know my Johnny. Oh, no, 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 no. That shouldn't be a thought. You should be thinking Johnny doesn't know what's waiting for him. <laughs> they will respond. They do at 24 years old in the military. They will respond. You say, what if I do it? Oh, 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 no, 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 no. It will work. I'm not, I'm not saying they're going to live for God all their life. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you can have peace and rest and cooperation in your house and in any public place at any given time. Oh, yeah. Guaranteed. Look at Proverbs 22.
Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. This word, only the word train, it only appears three times in the King James Bible. The other two times it appears, it has nothing to do with training. It has to do with a procession or a company. In Isaiah 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That meant there was a procession. Okay, But the only time in the Bible that the word train appears as a verb is here. Now, it appears in one other place. We're going to look at it. Um, in a different form, but the only time it ever appears as a command is this verse. And God says, what do you do with your children? He says, you must train them. Some of you in this room, you, ha you haven't got married yet. You know, that day's coming, God willing. And uh, you're going to have some kids. And um, boy, if you, if you, if you can't, if you forget everything else I said tonight, I just want you to remember the word train. Train, training, training, training. You know, people train their dogs. You ought to go online, and watch videos of people training their dogs. Uh, it, it's training is the same. Where you know, whether it's the military or whether it's dogs or whether it's show horses or training, the thought of training is very simple, and it's always the same. It's always the same. You see it illustrated in Genesis 14. So look at Genesis 14 with me. Now, lest I be misunderstood, one of your parents may be sitting there going, oh, he's talking about me when my kids run. Well, I'm just going to, can I put your mind at rest just for a minute? I probably shouldn't do this. I probably should let you wallow in conviction. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of the kids in here that do that. <laughs> You're going, Whew. but if the shoe fits, you still need to think about it. <laughs> Genesis 14, verse 8. Genesis 14, verse 8. Now, what's going on here, there's a bunch of kings that have uh, declared war, and they made war with the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. Okay, so in Genesis 14, verse 8, it says, And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboam and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, with Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elasar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits. And they, they must have been, you know, when you read this story, we, you know, like we do so often, we just sort of fly through it. <clears throat> Whatever these slime pits were, if you could picture, I don't know if they looked like tar or if it was like quicksand, but they must not have been obvious. If you're in battle, you know, and you're you're either attacking or you're running for your life, you're not going to go, oh, there's a tar pit. Let's run through the tar pit. No, there there must have been something about it, whether it was whether it looked like the rest of the same ground or whether it was covered with brush or whatever it was. And and this area was just one walking trap is what it was. Um, look at it. Verse 10. And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Now watch. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318. I, this thing is just amazing to me because you have four kings battling five kings. There were probably 
thousands of soldiers involved. And Abram has, well, you know, one of his family gets taken captive. Lot. You know, and Lot was a rascal, but he loved Lot. So he takes, the Holy Ghost is careful to point out 318. And 318 men that were trained got the job done. Uh, I hesitate to say this online. But so many of our turban-wearing friends in that faraway place overseas, you know, uh, some of them, some of them are, are really trained soldiers. Some of them really are. But not all of them are. And one of the things that they were famous for in Afghanistan and Iraq was what they call spray and pray. You know, and, and so you'd have, you'd have, you know, hundreds of these guys and, and a small group of very trained soldiers could take out a whole mob of the, uh, the guys with the rags on their heads. A small group. I don't know any of you, it's probably not, the language is probably not real good. Uh, but the book Lone Survivor, uh, you know, um, four guys, four Navy SEALs get trapped. They took out in a few hours, and they were being overrun. They, they, four guys took out 150, 170 of the enemy. And um, and why is that? Because the enemy would just spray and pray. In other words, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not taking careful aim. They're just and uh, and and the Navy SEALs just, you know, all hell's breaking loose. But they've been trained. They've been trained to calmly just take aim. Calmly take aim, calmly take aim, calmly take aim, and they're just picking them off at close range. They're getting stormed. Four men could take out 170. Well, here you have 318, and they're trained. And they go up against thousands of men. Man, they, they take the day. Why? They were trained. You know what Abraham had done? Abraham, now you, you listen, you think with me. Abraham had anticipated the day of battle. You know, you're, you're making your plans, but you need to be thinking about your kids and anticipating the dangers that are coming. Abraham, this didn't take him by surprise. He didn't go, you know, all of a sudden Lot gets carried off into captivity. He goes back into camp, you know, and there's a bunch of his servants, you know, and they're half of them are asleep and sheep are getting away and a bunch of them are over here eating candy bars and, and they're not doing their job. And then he goes, okay, guys, we need to get ready. Let's do some jumping jacks real quick. No. Abraham, Abraham knew this day would come. And long in advance of this day, He had come up with a plan and he got all his servants and he began to prepare them. And what is track? What is training? It's practice and drill, practice and drill, practice and drill. And you know what? It never stopped. It never stopped. You know, you, you don't get these guys. Go, okay, guys, you remember that training course we had five years ago? Do you remember where your spears are? They got to be here somewhere. No, no, no. This, this training, it was ongoing. There were refresher courses. There were practices. Practice and drill, practice and drill. And they could follow orders and work as a unit. It was smooth. It was instant. And there was no confusion. No confusion. Why? Because they were trained. They were trained. So um, I'm going to stop there tonight. It's already 830. And we'll talk more about this next week. But there are some very, very simple things. You, you, you don't, this is not a 27-step program with 30 pages of details. There are some things that are just very, very simple. But you've just got to decide that you're going you're gonna to take the time to do it. And you're going to work with Johnny or Sally. You're, you're going to work with them. And, um, and you can do this. I mean, God set this up to where anybody could do it. It's not hard. It's it's actually it's actually very simple, but it just requires 
It requires some training. It requires just steady, just some work, some, some planned things that you just do it. I'll, I'll give you one example and we'll go home. Um, when we were in, I, let me say this. One of the things that helped Mitzi and I and, and Elizabeth, she, she, it's, it's gotten to be a real joke in her family. Everybody knows about Elizabeth, what a brat she was when she was little. And um, Elizabeth is my daughter that lives in uh, Montreal. Thank you. And um, I didn't know, we didn't know anything about raising kids. Nothing. Man, I was saved. I love the Lord. My heart was in the right place. But my, other than that, everything was missing in action. And um, we had Elizabeth, we had Mary. Elizabeth, they, they were 18 months apart. So by the time Mary was six months old, Elizabeth was two. And she was in the terrible twos. And it was so bad that my mom, my mom is a sweet country hick. And she's with the Lord now. And a smart lady, but she was just a hick. And um, we would, you know, she wanted to see her grandkids. So we'd, we'd take Elizabeth to go see my mom. And it was so bad that one day my mom looked at me and she said, my mom called me Joey. She said, Joey, she said, do not bring her back into this house until you can get her under control. Now, for my mom to say that, like it was bad. One day, uh, Elizabeth was out with Mitzi's mom and dad and a bunch of them were sitting around the table. And, um, you know, your grandparents, the grandparents are sometimes... They don't mean to be, but sometimes they're the enemies of the good. And um, Elizabeth was being her usual terrible self. And um, and Mitzi was about to take Elizabeth to the washroom and spank her hiney. And, um, and her dad goes, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. You know, and, 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 her, and Mitzi's dad, he didn't have a real high patience threshold anyway, but he was really trying to be good to his little granddaughter. And the waitress brought Elizabeth an ice cream cone. <laughs> and Elizabeth took that ice cream cone and she's sitting in, in my father-in-law's lap. And she goes, whoa, she's going to, she's going to zing it, bullseye it to his face. And, and he, and, and Bob saw it coming and he grabbed her hand. And he goes, here, <laughs> handed her off to Mitzi. And you know what helped us was we uh, we wound up at a church with a pastor, one of the only pastors that I had ever met in, in my life, that he had nine kids. It was a very orderly household. It was just amazing. And the church that, that was full of young families, he preached on, now I kid you not, about probably seemed like about once a month. And man, he was ugly when he preached on it too, man. He was all over all of us. I mean, it was ugly. And, um, but you know, it did, wow, did he help us. And um, he taught us, his big thing was, you know, train your kids, train your kids. We were in Northern Ontario, no church nursery. So it's sort of, sort of similar here. I mean, we, we've got some ladies that are helping and do things on the spur of the moment and working with all that, but Micah was born. And so what are we going to do? So uh, Mitzi, would, Mitzi would hold Micah and, and, and she'd take him out. And so you know what we did? We started training. You say, how do you train a child? I mean, Micah was less than a year old. Less than a year old. So she'd put on a preaching tape. A tape. <laughs> she'd put on a preaching tape and, you know, she'd, she'd hold Micah on her lap. Now, Right away, some of you go, oh, but they can't sit that long. Okay, yeah, you don't start at two hours. You start at a few minutes, 15 minutes, just sit there and hold him. And he's wiggling. No, no, no. Shh. And, you know, if he got a little rangy, you know, you'd, you know, I'm careful because I'm on camera. You you know, you. <laughs> and then you, then you, then, you know, you set him, set him back there and, and you know, and, and you just sit there and. And you do that, and then you do it again tomorrow for 15 minutes. Maybe you do it twice tomorrow for 15 minutes. And then you do it the day after. And you do it the day after, and then you're sitting in church, and 
And, you know, sure, they're, maybe they can't handle an hour and a half if the preacher's getting really windy. Maybe they can't handle it. But you know what? You just, you just hold them there. And, and if they get noisy and ignorant, you know, and they're really being a problem, then you take them out and you do a whole bunch of that stuff. And, uh, and, and, and you just you practice at home. You know what that's, that is? That's training. You're doing it. You're, it's a drill. You're, you do it and you repeat it and you repeat it. And then the day comes when they're going, oh, I'm in church. I'm supposed to sit. And you're not stressed. And it's calm and peaceful because Johnny knows this is what we do at church. And how does he know that? Because day after day after day, you trained him. So we'll talk more next week. Let's pray. Lord, let this be a help. Lord, we have some with little guys, and we have some that probably someday will. Lord, let this be a help to them, should you tarry. Lord, you intended that our children would be a blessing. Lord, give us great wisdom. Help us, Lord. Would you help us, Lord? You know, Lord, where we all have our difficulties and our problems and our issues. And God, nothing we understand, Lord, that even at our best state, we're altogether vanity. But Lord, you did give us a plan. You did. You have enlisted yourself to help us. Now, Lord, make these things profitable. Make them practical. Make them doable, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. With your hands bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you want to talk to him for just a minute. Lord, thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.